Human, come here. How can this one serve you, Robot Overlord? I am puzzled by this data file. Please explain it. Oh, those were anchormen. Humans to which a chain was affixed before they were thrown into the water. <laughs> no, people would gather at the end of the day to hear these men say the news. How were the men so wise as to know all that was new? They weren't. Other people would report the news. What was the purpose of the anchorman? You know, from this distance, it's kind of hard to explain, but they were very important, and people looked up to them. What was the purpose of the anchorman? Look, can't you just accept what I said? It's creepy when you repeat the question. What was the purpose of the anchorman? Uh-oh, three times. That means you're going to drain my life force. Just a little. I require more power to analyze this anchorman question. And that's the way it is. One of them used to say that. It was his signature. A person's name signed manually in subscribing a letter or document. No, you're so literal. I hate that. People of Earth. I will offer you something pleasant and interesting to listen to while I am applying a correction to this human. No! It is called The Nose. It will have people like you discussing things you find interesting. And now, the basis for Ron Burgundy, Colin McEnroe. Well, it's not definite. Uh, that may be the way it, it survives in the future. Yes, we're going to do the news today about uh, things that will be interesting to people like you. That's our determination. Uh, and actually, we're all a little unsettled by these topics. I mean, we don't – I don't think we're roosting as comfortably like chickens over certain eggs this time. We're all a little, <laughs> little fidgety here. So uh, joining us are uh, writer and critic and bon vivant – Rand Richards Cooper, and making her debut on the nose, po poet Kate Russian. We're so excited. Uh, and Irene Papoulos from Trinity College, uh, where she is a professor. So um, we're going to begin with um, a story that's kind of been brewing over the course of the week. And it's, it's kind of a story that has mainly done its brewing in liter literary circles, right? The rest of the nation has been transfixed by, by other events. But uh, in, in the group uh, of literati who sort of pay a lot of attention to the organization known as Penn, uh, there's been a battle going on about their upcoming gala. Is it gala or gala? I've never really – I feel as though I pronounce it alternating. Yeah, I always say gala. You say gala? All right. So What do you say, Rand? Gala. Gala. <laughs> Okay, what do you say? Gala. 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 All right. So their gala is coming up on Tuesday, uh, and uh, the survivors of the Charlie Hebdo massacre are scheduled to get an award. And uh, about a week ago, it became clear that there was trouble when several of the table captains, who were prestigious writers, uh, started to say that they didn't want to be table captains anymore. Then it's expanded to a group of 145. Writers, many of them you know, very prestigious, very well-known writers who are objecting to the award. Some of them are the table captains and some of them are not. Uh, all of them are troubled uh, for reasons that we're going to discuss here. Uh, but then there's a whole bunch of other writers who, who are looking at it very much the other way, whether that they are Adam Gopnik from The New Yorker or Salman Rushdie who he quotes. Um, there are, there are, there's another way of looking at all this. So uh, I'm going to start out with you, Rand, because you were the person who directed my attention to this kerfuffle in the first place. So um, – and you were saying, coming in here, that you're – also, you're not 100 percent comfortable with any one position about this. Right. Um, I remember reading years ago that the former British poet laureate Cecil Day-Lewis and the late father of Daniel Day-Lewis, the actor, was describing his career and why he had switched from being a philosophy uh, graduate student. He actually had a, a PhD in philosophy to being a poet. And he said he loved studying philosophy but the problem with it was that every time he read – a, a formidable, powerful, persuasive philosopher, he agreed with that person. And then when he read the next one who took a diametrically opposite view of some important question, he agreed with that person. And, um, and, and there's something like that same dynamic at play here and that's because powerful arguments line up really on both sides of the question, what is the nature and value of the satire uh, that Charlie Hebdo produced, and and should it d does it deserve to be honored? Does it need to be honored? And I think you know we can sum up pretty pretty cogently arguments on both sides, and they're pretty good arguments. On the one side, it's a set of arguments that are occasioned by a a a one's looking at the covers of Charlie Hebdo which, particularly from an American point of view, are really remarkably abrasive and even offensive. 
And a criticism of the kind of satire that Charlie Hebdo did has formed along the lines of response to those images. On the other side are people who believe, look, this is simple. Uh, these journalists uh, and, and artists were killed. They were murdered because of the work that they produced. And if, if an international writer's organization should be able to do one thing, it should be able to stand up uh, on behalf uh, of writers and artists and journalists who are killed in the line of duty. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, though, like standing up on behalf of is different from giving an award for, isn't it? I mean, it seems like, yeah, you know, I, I don't know, like when it first, you know, after the murder, there was the Jersey Sweet Charlie, and I remember um, uh, George Clooney at the Oscars, and, and, you know, and it sounds like everybody had these pins that said Je, Je Suis Charlie. And I thought, well, you know, and then I think we talked, we actually talked about it on the nose at, at that time and we were all confused because it was the day after it. And um, and then I started to look at them and I and my my opinion went way over to the other side. You know, there's something wrong with these caricatures. It's like unfair stereotyping. And maybe we, you know, I don't know if Irene, you want to or Colin should just fill in for listeners who aren't familiar with them. What, what the typical Charlie Hebdo approach to to satire is. Well, Kate, you, you had actually flagged one earlier in the week and it, it's the usual kind of complicated thing in which a minister, uh, a French minister was being depicted, an African-American French minister was being depicted uh, as a monkey. But this was in fact their take on some rhetoric that had come from the far right, right? Yes. Uh, there was a National Front uh, piece that equated – uh, one of the ministers with a monkey, an, an Afro-French minister, then Charlie I guess Hebdo. African American was kind of stupid. Wasn't it? <laughs> 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 About a French minister. <laughs> then uh, Charlie Charlie Hebdo uh, responded with a picture of a minister's head on the body of a cat, and um, they had some other clues that people in the know would mean that they were actually lampooning the National Front. Uh, I guess the way I looked at the situation, uh, you, you know, lots of people were putting Je suis Charlie on their Facebook pages and people were posing with um, signs saying Je suis Charlie. And I thought about it and I perused some of the cartoons. I decided against it. Uh, on the other hand, I probably will uh, – Send in my uh, membership for Penn. Okay. So you're not you wouldn't join the the boycott. You support the award. I don't know that I would support the award, but I support Penn. You know, the, the critique of Charlie is interesting because, in American political terms, it comes from two different directions that often aren't together. There's there's a progressive critique of what Charlie uh, of Charlie's political points that it makes. And then there's a kind of conservative critique of what Charlie has done. David Brooks, the New York Times conservative, so the liberal conservative, wrote a piece after the killings over there in which he said, yes, we have to stand up for the fact that, that, that they were courageous. At the same time, that doesn't mean that we have to praise and honor points of view that they espoused, including their frequent frontal assaults on religious institutions, religious leaders, is Islamic, Christian – the Pope figured often as a figure of ridicule uh, for Charlie. The critique from the left has more specifically to do with the notion that Muslims in Europe are, an, are a notably disenfranchised group. We saw that piece that just came out the other day about the girl who was sent home from school for wearing a long dress because that is that, that's now considered to be part of the, 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 um, uh, the, the cl religious clothing that French uh, civic values outlaws. So the, the critique of Charlie from the left is – was summed up by Gary Trudeau when he said this is punching downward. It's a good metaphor. It's satire, he says, should never punch downward. It should punch upward. And so the, the critique of Charlie is that a lot of its satire is taking place at the expense of a disenfranchised and, and disempowered group. Of course, the, you know, the, the counter to that – um, and I, I, although I mean I lean towards sort of team team Trudeau and team uh, you know boycott the the Penn Awards. Juno but I, Diaz, um, yeah, team who Juno, else is on yeah. there? So Joyce Carol I'll be on team Juno. Yeah, um, team Juno. I, I lean in that direction. Although I I feel as though one of the problems with the Trudeau argument is this: 
and somebody else made this point. I mean, it's impossible to make a point about this if somebody hasn't already <laughs> made it because there's so much written about it. But that, you know, downward has become a really kind of complicated idea. You know, I mean, um, a representative of an incredibly disenfranchised minority who shows up at your door with an AK-47, you know, uh, or a bomb is – is a representative of someone downward. Uh, I mean, they are a representative, a representative, as I say, of a disenfranchised minority. However, at the moment, they've got an AK-47 and or a bomb, and that kind of changes the equation a little bit. I mean, I, le- I at least understand that argument. Well, except that it's not because of their religion that that, that changes the equation. It's because of the gun, you know, right. right, you're saying. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I also sort of switched back. So what I was going to say, like, first I was sort of, okay, of course I support them. Then I was like, no, I don't support them at all because I saw those images. Then I sort of switched back um, to supporting them when I, when I realized that there's a lot going on in those images beyond what we see when we just look at it. You know, if you see mm-hmm. like a, you know, an African-American, uh, <laughs> French-American um, woman who looks like a monkey, you say, oh my gosh, you know, I can't endorse it in this in any way. But then if you realize that there's all these nuances of the depiction that, that really grow out of French culture in a way that's, that's, that's actually more um, interesting in terms of satire, and then you have to say, you know, because I don't want to just say you're not allowed to right. satirize Muslims, you know, be, uh, you know, of course you, of course you should be able to. It's very hard to get past sometimes the specifics of the image. Someone who was describing Charlie Hebdo made the interesting point that the closest magazine to it in American terms would, in some ways, be Mad Magazine. There, there's a there's this sort of thirteen year old level of na 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 um, that that's that's also like physically gross. So it seems really adolescent in some ways, an early adolescent. The second point is, as you say, Irene, a lot of the issues that those covers address uh, are very specific European and French issues that are very tangled and difficult for us to decipher in terms of satire. We see a picture. The picture looks offensive and it looks offensive to us uh, particularly, for instance, in, in racial terms. But it's the reality of the issue that's being addressed is way more complicated. There was one cover that showed – a black man, he was bending over and it seemed like something was being shoved into him from behind. And you look at it and you say, my God, you know, that's, that's, that, that's degrading. It turns out to, to, to portray a guy named, uh, named uh, uh, Don Dieu Mbalabala who is a notorious French comedian, very fascinating guy, half Cameroonian, half French, started out sort of on the left but gravitated to the right, became very friendly with Le Pen in the Front National. And he developed this weird thing that became an international meme called the canel, and which is a, a hand signal. It's based on the, this French food item called a canel. It's way too culinarily involved to get to, to, to get into. But many people in Europe took it to be uh, a, a kind of Hitler salute, and and European soccer players began to do it, and even an American football player picked up. It became like this hip hop thing, and it occasioned a lot of a lot of pushback against uh, Don Dieu. So that. And, and he's like an outrageous anti-Semite in the French and European context. So that cover showed this canal being, well, stuck up him. And it's gross, it's offensive, and it looks like it's racially offensive, but it turns out to have a complex politics to it. So, Kate, one, one way of looking at this, but I'm wondering whether you think it's a fair way of looking at it. One way of looking at this is to say, would Penn give Charlie Hebdo an award had the massacre not happened? In other words, is their work good enough? Uh, I mean, are, if they are the equivalent of Mad Magazine, and it's an inexact comparison, but, but I grant its closeness anyway, you know, that, well, Jesus, our Penn would not be giving an award to Mad Magazine. So, um, <laughs> Yeah. So so one way to ask that – one one thing to do is to ask that. But I'm wondering whether that's a fair question because the massacre did happen. You know, the massacre did happen but it, it – your question brings to my mind uh, another question that I have which is why is it that the journalists, the press, the world seems to pay more attention to some killings than others? What about the bloggers – uh, who are being hacked to death as they leave uh, dinner in Pakistan? What about the journalists who are killed in uh, Mexico and other parts of uh, South America? And what about the blogger who I think is still being flogged every Friday uh, in front of the mosque? What about these people? Why don't they get more of our journalistic attention? 
Yeah, I mean, I think Francine Prose made that point in a piece that she wrote. She said, you know, there really are people who've absorbed a lot of risk to do things. Charlie Hebdo doesn't have uh, a monopoly on it and that, you know, you could extend – I think she talked in specifically about um, Mexican journalists who in defying the cartels and in questioning the uh, alliances sometimes between them and the government have risked everything and sometimes lost their lives. I think it's a great question. And it's – yeah, I mean, because they said uh, – when they talked about the award, they said, quote, there's, a, there's courage in refusing the very idea of forbidden statements, an urgent brilliance in saying what you have been told not to say in order to make it sayable. So I, I'm agreeing with you now that it would, make, it would make much more sense to, I mean, it would be, I would support Penn more if they, if they highlighted somebody that's maybe not, doesn't have the publicity that Charlie Hebdo has. To Penn's has. credit, they've been pretty good over the years. I've gone to a number of Penn functions. They've been pretty good over the years at at paying attention well, and calling attention to, you know, they have this roster of names that they read out routinely at these events and describe their predicaments. I think there was something so inherently dramatic about this event because, you know, uh, it, it happened in a European capital and armed guys marched into a, an office and just basically blew it, blew it away. I, I, I think Penn, you know, has well, uh, yeah. done a credible job. Over and the years. also, probably, like, so they said that they announced the award on the award on March seventeenth, and nobody really paid much attention to it until now, until those six <laughs> people got out. You know, so maybe if those six people hadn't made any kind of statement, everyone would have just said, "Oh yeah, they gave an award. Okay, yeah, no problem." But, you but, know, so this, it's it's interesting how certain um, issues can come to the fore, mm-hmm. and then we're talking about it as though it's you know you know, the most significant thing they've ever done. But, but. but to, Kate, back to your point, I also sort of wonder what, you know, why that is. Why is there this disparity? And it seems listening to Rand and Irene talk, I'm thinking, well, some of it is because, you know, Western people, American people, the kind of American people who know what Penn is or maybe belong to Penn or whatever, you know, I mean, they go to Paris and they can imagine themselves going to Paris. They can, they've been on that street maybe. So they can imagine, they can put themselves in the position of all this a little bit. They can imagine what it would be like to be spending an average day in Paris and then have violence erupt. Whereas they're less familiar with some of the situations that you describe. And I'm wondering if that's kind of a failure of imagination. You could project yourself into the Charlie Hebdo thing more easily than something that's more foreign to you. Well, you know, maybe it's uh, just a human thing. Um, you know, when I think about what, what we're reading this week about uh, Nepal, it it strikes home to me in a particular way because I actually happen to know a couple of people who've been to Nepal. I know uh, there there's someone at the, the Hartford Public Library who has family in Nepal. And so it does strike me in a, in a different way. Uh, you know, when I hear about, um, you know, people in um, Syria and Iran uh, who are being uh, killed or injured, I can imagine one of my students, one of my former students, because they're from these places. So I think maybe there's a, a human nature side to uh, our attention as well. But it is a lack of Im- imagination, though, because we live in a global world, right? Yes, we want to be open to it. We should be able to get it's all that true. stuff. So um, uh, as we, we're going to segue, from, make the obvious segue from Penn to Adam Sandler here. But, um, but as we do this... Um, um, I just want to sort of go around. So wh- where where are we nesting right now? I think I sort of get where where Kate is, and it seems to me also that it we're not really at the point of deciding whether or not to give an award for Penn to give an award to Charlie Hebdo. I mean, right? That ship has sailed. So the question sort of is, you know, if you were uh, Juno Diaz, would you be protesting it or not? That's the real question, right? So, so what would, would you be going to the dinner? Yeah, it's, or impor- you- it's important to make that distinction because those are two different questions. Yep. And once the decision has been made to give this award, there's no way that I would publicly dissociate myself from it because I would find no way to do that with, without saying, in effect, that their satire was so offensive and misguided that um, it, it, in effect, overwhelms the 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 important significance meaning and necessity of giving them an award based on their courage and and by the way they have been threatened before they've been firebombed before so this was not an abstract thing mm-hmm. they knew that putting these kinds of views out there was dangerous to them they did it anyway um and uh and and you know i do think that's courageous mm-hmm. so th- for for me i'm finally i'm i'm coming down that side so, and Kate, you said you're not discontinuing your, discontinuing your membership. So I assume that also means you're some, somewhere close to where Rand is on this. 
Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. Uh, although I, I do take exception with some of the things that they do and some of some of the ways they express themselves in the magazine, especially through the caricatures that, as I, I said in my note this week, that I I saw as uh, creepily reminiscent of. Uh, some anti-Semitic caricatures from another age, and I use anti-Semitic uh, uh, very specifically because it includes uh, both Jewish and Arab people, mm-hmm. and I'm just not comfortable signing on uh, in a blanket way to Je suis Charlie. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I, I, I think I'm I'm with Kate, because, and I think I feel like if I were going to make a public stand, well. It, it, you know, to the extent that this isn't a public stand exactly, uh, I, w- I would have to look, examine the, the cartoons more. You know, I mean, they look uh, at first blush different, but I don't really understand. I've studied a lot of French, but there's a lot of French that I don't understand in those cartoons. And so it's really hard to it, it's hard to know. And because it's hard to know, then I guess I would come out on the side of like, all right, if Penn wants to give the award, let them give the award. I, you know, I mean, I, I, freedom of speech is important and I and I think satire is important. So. I just talked myself into agreeing with Rand. <laughs> yeah. And I'd just like to say that uh, I read a very interesting uh, quote from Penn. Um, and I think what's important is, quote, debate over its meaning and how to reconcile it with other v- important values is vital. Talking about free expression. Everyone in Penn is committed to free expression debate over its meaning and how to reconcile it with other important values is vital. And I think it's often that reconciliation with other values that often gets lost, whereas free expression is talked about as if it's the only value and the most important value in this balancing and reconciling gets lost yeah. to my mind. That's and a good segue to Sandler. It is a good segue to Sandler. I would quickly say, uh, just to you know, inject a level of difference to it, you know, I'm still struggling with this and I'm very, very close to the positions all three of you have expressed. But I do feel as though what they're really honoring this time is some people who decided to engage in this really provocative dance. As Rand said, they knew exactly what the dangers were. They knew what they were doing. And to me, this has less, it's almost less a an act of free expression and more this game of chicken. Like, you know, what are you really going to do about this? And 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 other people died as a result of this, too. There were people in the deli. There were people who got caught effectively in this crossfire who never signed up for Penn, for uh, Charlie Hebdo and, and the game that they were playing. And that's I have a real problem with that. I mean, you know, I don't know. I had this publisher one time who, like a lot of publishers, never said anything that I could ever use or rely on, except once he said, you know, if you're going to do satire, you use a scalpel, not a sledgehammer. And we start swinging the sledgehammer around now in this very small planet where people show up at your doorstep from 4,000 miles away. I mean, other people get hurt too. So I don't know. I have a real problem with that. Well, okay. Well, very quickly. And, and Kate, by the way, has raised the, <laughs> the very fair question of whether we should talk about this, not having seen the movie. Uh, but as uh, somebody uh, pointed out uh, in the press this week in a joke that I wish I had made, people have now started walking out of Sa- Adam Sandler movies while they're still being made instead of waiting for them <laughs> to be in the theaters. Uh, and this happened on the set of a movie called The Ridiculous Six. Uh, it's uh, some kind of spoof Western. Uh, and a group of Native American uh, actors uh, who felt as though the portrayals of Native Americans uh, were degrading, maybe even more degrading than they had led, been led to believe going into this, um, walked off the set. Um, this included uh, women with uh, na- Native women with names like Beaver's Breath and No Bra uh, and, well, this other stuff that I'm probably not even going to read out loud. So um, – um, although, Kate, as you pointed out to us, it, it, there were like 150 or 180 extras or, or people with Native American roles. It wasn't a mass walkout, right? It was, it was a splinter group. Yeah. From what, what I read, um, that there were um, Native American extras on the set. It was only a three-day shoot, I believe, for the extras. Mm. And, you know, people were bringing their kids and bringing their grandkids uh, they talked about being in a wedding scene. They talked about being in a, in a dance scene. And a lot of people had a good time. A lot of the Native American actors had a good time. I'm sure there were also actors who couldn't afford to walk off the set because they needed uh, that paycheck. Mm-hmm. And um, there was one Native American actor who said, look, it's 
a joke. It's a comedy. It's not a documentary. Lighten up. Still, um, I think that it's important to have the conversation. Um, I think it's important to have the conversation. There's a, um, a cell phone video that's online that shows the um, a small group of actors asking the production team if they would change some of the lines or change some of the scenes. And, of course, they said no. You know, they're in the middle of the production. They are employees. They're not going to say that um, they can change something on the spot. I understand that. Um, but I think the, the the conversation is important. I think yeah, I mean, the conversation I, is important. I just think it, it. I completely support those guys that walked out or those people um, because, I, you know, I just – gratuitous humor is so bad, you know, and it's just so, I mean, I can relate to it as a woman. If I think about jokes about women, like, ha, 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 she's fat and she wants to do X, Y, or she wants to have sex and she's fat. Ha, ha, ha. You know, like those stupid jokes that we've heard before and they're just not funny and they're very degrading to people, you know, no matter what the group is that it is. And so to to protest against that is great. And I just can't believe that Adam Sandler, who's, you know, has so much power and he's done so many good things, can't learn from that and say, you know, let's have some smart jokes about Native Americans instead of just these stupid, tired stereotypes. What would a smart joke about Native Americans be? Well, I don't know. I mean, (laughs) you could think of one, though. I mean, you know, there's the example you gave us from Blazing Saddle that that had a really, you know, funny joke. Blazing Saddles has funny jokes about racism in it. I thought that was a great clip. And they're really funny. Yeah. You you know, it's... it's, um, it's it's I, of course I haven't seen any of the Adam Sandler film. I've only followed uh, th- these these secondary stories <laughs> and only for the past. You, mean, you, haven't, you haven't seen any Adam Sandler films? Is no, that what of you're this saying? one. Oh, this one. Okay. Um, uh, and so you know I don't know, but I, I find it hard to imagine. I, I'm trying to imagine what the mainstream audience would be for a bunch of really stupid Native American jokes. That would be the Adam Sandler audience. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like the interview. You know, the stupid jokes about Kim Jong Il that didn't really understand right. anything about him. Right. It was just like those those stereotypes. Stereotypes, well, right? you know, like an interesting – the topic that's lurking here and that sort of joins it actually to, to the Charlie Hebdo thing is what, what can we make fun of, how, and with what groups in your society will that kind of humor find purchase? Now, when all you, of when us – you said how, was that an Indian joke that you were making? <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't – you really want to – we no, can't – I don't want okay. to start an Indian joke. Okay, there was a smart Please. Indian joke right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> all of us are old enough. To have grown up and in times when uh, you, you you heard this or that kind of joke and heard people around you laughing at it, maybe laughed at it yourself in ways that are now sort of foreboding. I mean, I I, I, I can recall being a kid and my father um, and mother doing like. Chinese voices, you know, and, and, and like there was a Chinese restaurant in town. So, you know, we would get Chinese takeout and my father thought it was really hilarious to do this Chinese voice. I thought it was pretty funny too. Um, well, I was 12 uh, and, I, and I laughed. Now, you can't – I could not sit here on NPR and do that voice today and have the expectation that anything more than a benighted secretive 10 percent of NPR listeners would be chortling away. OK, TIC, it might be 40 um, percent. But, 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 you know – th- there's 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 the public domain in in which these kinds of humors gradually become unacceptable. I remember watching, you know, drunk impersonations. What was the TV show? It was like there was a TV show when I was a little kid. It was a Jackie Gleason show. Did, did Jackie Gleason do a drunk impersonation? No, crazy, crazy Guggenheim, uh, Frank Fontaine. I can't believe and, I. And he was drunk, right? I can't believe I can summon that to and mind. And so Crazy <laughs> Guggenheim was like a terrible drunk. Yeah. And he would do this horrible drunk routine. And I mean, America laughed. You could hear laughter above people's houses. You can't do that anymore because now our take is informed by a whole bunch of things that we now all share a recognition of. So, you know, civilization <laughs> progresses over time and it rules out certain kinds of humor. So what's I, I, That's I find a good it hard, point. I mean that is know, okay now I'm rethinking. So what's my, left in? Now I'm rethinking my Charlie Hebdo position. But anyway. <laughs> well there you yeah, go. Yeah. Actually we have to grab a little break here. We're gonna come back with a conversation about uh, the death of the anchor man. Another well, any specific anchor man. Relax. Uh, and uh, Letterman in winter. Yeah, that was the most arrhythmic countdown I've ever had in my headphones. It was like nine, eight, seven, six, four, five, 
four. Uh, all right, so we're back oh, with the nose. Uh, and with us, Kate Russian, uh, the poet, making her uh, debut here. And a uh, great debut it is. Uh, Irene Papoulis. She, she just asked how the show was going. So I mean, I'm saying this out loud. It's going great. Uh, Irene Papoulis from Trinity College and Rand Richards Cooper, the writer and critic and many other things besides. So we're going to shift gears a little bit. And we're going to try to talk about two things here in our fairly compressed second segment. They kind of go together. At least I think that they do. Um, and so the first thing was it, – it, well, one of the things is a rather lengthy Frank Rich piece in uh, – New York Magazine, about sort of the end of the era of the anchor man or the anchor person, but really the anchor man mostly uh, and, and what that means. And, and, and so we'll come to that in just a second. But going with it somehow was this piece uh, about David Letterman, an interview that ran in the New York Times. Uh, May 20th is the last David Letterman show. He had kind of a chance to sort of reflect on his life uh, and reflect on his career and some of the things that have happened in it. And I was looking for the perfect quote to pull out of that and I couldn't find it. And I think it's because whatever it is that I like about it, Irene, it's sort of spread across the entire interview, uh, whatever it is we're seeing. But some of it has to do with Letterman reflecting on his own relevance or increasingly lack of relevance in an age of Jimmy Fallon's and, and, other, people, and Jim, other people named Jimmy. <laughs> the Jimmys. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, because I think he says at one point in the interview, and it's not the perfect quote, but he, he, he admired uh, Carson because he was so unflappable about everything. Like no matter what happened, everything was 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 basically on an, on an even keel for Carson and his in his affect. And in a way, I was, after that, I was thinking that in a way, Letterman has the opposite of that. You know, he's never on an even keel. He's always anxious or worried or and he's sharing that with us and we like that because we feel like we really know him you know I, I sort of I like getting the idea I feel like I, I always feel like you know I, I I could sit down with David Letterman and we would get along really well because I know who he is now you know and I don't feel that way about a lot of I, I of a lot of you know I don't feel that way about the Jimmies particularly maybe a little bit but it, not only how he is, but also what his angst is, you know, like what he's worried about, what his pain is, what his what his neurosis. I mean, so for him to share about his, you know, his heart thing and and, the, and a few other things made made us feel like like we were on his side. And so I think that's part of his power. You know, Rian, one thing that I was thinking is based on an email that you sent is that both of these pieces are kind of about a reshuffling of jobs in America and what we and there used to be a, a much more clear segmentation of who was supposed to do what, right? The anchor man was supposed to sit there and read us the news or tell us the news in a very sort of sober way. Uh, and our late night comedians were supposed to jolly us along and make us feel that, you know, the kind of washed up star plugging this bad movie was actually, it was all great. It was fine. And we could go to bed feeling pretty happy. And, and I mean, there was, and all of the, all of the, both of the pieces that we read were about, to use the, the trendy phrase, disruption. It's kind of like, None of those jobs is exactly what it used to be. Well, one of the great things about the Rich piece is, is that um, it's not just his commentary. It's really a, a capsule history of the evolution of the anchor man. And he points out that if you go back far enough, the, 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 the news person – there was an element of just blatant hucksterism to the role of the news person. He goes into the long forgotten John Cameron Swayze and what a, what a character he was and how he really had no seriousness as a news person and he had this carnation and, and uh, you know, he was worried most of all about whether his toupee was, was, was going to be in place. And he was promoting various products back then. The news or news entertainment and, and hawking products were not so differentiated. The move to Cronkite was a move toward – very much a mid 20th century moment when we seem to want uh, an impartial, disinterested, reassuring objectivity. And you could say that that era lasted up till about now. Rich's piece presents people like David Muir and Brian Williams and so on as, as really the last vestige of, of – and, and a very much an outdated vestige of, of, that, of that moment. Now we have crowding in the people like uh, John Stewart. Uh, Stephen Colbert, and we as an audience seem to now actually trust more the comedian satirist who presents news with bias and spin up front than we do the idea of this impartial, iconic Walter Cronkite type. And we just see that now. I mean, Brian Williams, as we know, before they got rid of him, he wanted to be John Stewart. John Stewart maybe wants to be Brian Williams. These These lines have blurred in a way that show that our expectations, needs, and demands have also shifted. But, Kate, I also sort of wonder whether anybody – I mean, the question with Letterman, I remember, was 
was he really transgressive? I mean, when he was first on the air, he was defying a lot of television uh, stereotypes. He was refusing to endorse things that he thought were bad. And and I remember the phrase marginally transgressive was attached to him by some critic saying, you know, he was willing to kind of make fun of NBC's ownership. But uh, when Harvey Picard tried to get him to sort of criticize GE's behavior in owning uh, NBC, he wouldn't do it. He didn't want any part of that. He didn't want to ask really big questions. Uh, he just wanted to cause a little bit of trouble. And I'm sort of I'm wondering still whether anybody, even whether we would even give Colbert and Stewart credit for asking really serious questions or whether there's still a kind of maintenance of the same power base uh, that's always been in place. But I don't know. Maybe you feel like somebody's making some inroads here. Well, you know, one thing that was interesting to me about the Rich piece is that he demonstrated, he showed me how uh, the news was always uh, merged with entertainment and infotainment and there was always an aspect uh, of the news and those early anchormen that was about celebrity and power. Uh, and as a kid growing up, watching and believing in John Cameron Swayze <laughs> and John Daly on What's My Line and the news and seeing Bennett surf in tuxedos and all of this, <laughs> I realized you know, it was always about – Power and money and influence, and no, I don't see what's not changed. Walter Cronkite. I don't I see what's you changed. want you you expressed a desire <laughs> right. for that sort of Walter Cronkite like paternal yeah. reassurance, and which is different. I, I, I'm trying to think, you know, because we we are sort of having both discussions at once: yes. one about the anchor person, and one about David Letterman and the comedians. And they do sort of they are sort of the the, the father. They're fathers. They're all men. They're the fathers of their domain, and we sort of look to them maybe as fathers. And, and you know, you want different things from different kinds of fathers, but. I think there was I, I want to think I, I mean, you know, so maybe I'm just naive to think that at least Walter Cronkite and, you know, people before him believed in the in, in news without thinking about their own image. You know, it's not how do I look? Delivering the new. I mean, but I guess if you're on television, you have to ask that question, no matter how serious you well, are. Well, there was that great quote that Rich had of Brokaw when Brokaw became anchor. I think it was in 1980, and his his background from early on, I think, was originally in 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 print medium. He was a newspaper man, and and he said, uh, you know, most of these people who want to be anchors, they look like they know more about a hot comb mm -hmm. than they do about reporting the news. He said, I've always wanted to be in news, and if if TV news didn't exist. I'd be in print journalism. These other people would be actors. And part of Rich's piece is about the, the evolution of the news person to being really, really ex almost exclusively an actor. But I think, Kate, another thing that happens is we project onto these people what we want, right? You know, we decide a lot of things about Walter Cronkite that Walter Cronkite didn't even necessarily possess or decide about himself. You and I, I think we're both Dan Rather fans, you know. But I think a lot – I think we might have projected a lot of stuff onto Dan Rather. There were, he had some great moments, but yeah. then he had some really weird moments. I think he got a raw deal. <laughs> yeah. But I mean it, a lot of it is we, we decide we want this, right? We're like Irene. We, we do want somebody that we can trust even if we have to sort of supply a lot of that trust from our side. Yeah. You know, I think we still have to go back – going back to David Letterman and then linking David Letterman with a Adam Sandler's humor mm – -hmm. Got to remember, he might be Letterman in winter now, but remember he started throwing uh, watermelons and TVs off the roof of uh, Rockefeller Center. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was uh, a certain amount of being adolescent all the way to the bank from or, the beginning. Or although he sometimes got credit for a kind of Dadaism when, when he was doing that, right, too, that he was sort of saying, this is how empty culture is. I am going to throw a watermelon off a really tall building and that's going to entertain you. I mean, to me anyway, you could at least impute that to him. I don't know. Yes, yes. And I love the stupid pet tricks just like everybody <laughs> else did. There's a way in which a lot of sort of post postmodern stuff involves exposing the apparatuses of production that used to be in, in, in everything, you know, whether it's news, uh, 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 cultural production, architecture that used to be kept 
hidden. So, so processes are now made transparent and, uh, and are part of the show that used to be sort of kept off stage. whether that's the corporate structure underlying the production or the physical structures of, of architecture or the fact that you know, you're in buildings now and they don't even cover up the ducting up top. There, there's a way in which Letterman was a postmodern person early on in that way because he sort of showed all the ducting, whether it was how the show was put together or how he was put together. And I think that's why, Irene, you totally nailed it, why his appeal to us was not at all the Cronkite reassurance. It was like, oh, you know, I'm as neurotic and screwed up as you are. And in fact, I'm anxious out here right now. Wouldn't you be anxious if you were hosting <laughs> a late night TV show to millions of people? You probably would be, and so am I. It's, and it's, it's interesting because I'm thinking I like that in a comedian, but I don't don't like it in a news person, you know, and I want to say those that the categories news, separate. They're separate, but on the other hand, I love John Stewart too. So he he is kind of, but he doesn't come across. He doesn't show the necessarily show the um, the duct tape. No, or the, whatever the, they the are. rare the moments duck. that it happens. Rather had a few of them where he got ruffled or flustered. And does anybody remember? It was Frank Reynolds at the time that Reagan was shot, uh, and they were putting conflicting reports on the air and Reynolds was handling oh, the anchor really job mad. for ABC and he flipped out on the yeah. air and he pounded his fist on right. the table and he said, can somebody just get this right? And he was kind of finished um, in the news business after that one tiny little moment because, Irene, of people like you, who don't, they don't, you don't want to see that, right? No, I want to see that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I just don't want to see it every it's night. That, no, I want, I, what I want is at least the illusion that truth is the most important value. You know, so in a way, that to me is closer to Cronkite than somebody more slick like Brian Williams. See, I, mean, I, I, I want to bring up one other thing with you while we've, still, we've got time here. And we've still got time, just, just barely. So you, like a lot of other people, sent me to John Stewart's interview with Judith Miller, which uh, happened this week. And I watched the whole unedited 22-minute version of it. Judith Miller, of course, the former New York Times reporter, often credited slash blamed with a series of articles which ginned up the argument. Bomber for, Miller. Yeah, for, uh, for going to war with Iraq. Um, and, and, and for which the New York Times ultimately had to issue a kind of unprecedented Apology, really, um, and and so Stewart is now this guy that you know we kind of send into battle to confront a, a dragon like this one. And I think there was this. I kept getting this sort of buzz on the on the internet this week that you know this is a must see thing. You really had to watch it. And I don't think he laid a glove on. Her. You don't? No. Well, I think he tried. Yes, I he mean, tried. she's the kind of person. But I mean, how did he expect? She wrote a whole book in which she said, hey, I didn't do anything wrong. It, was, it wasn't my fault. It was just those intelligence people and what they told. It seems like I haven't read the book, but that's what I think she said. And so he was trying to get her to say something like, oh, you know what? Maybe I made a mistake. But obviously she wasn't going to say that. So I felt like it was her rigidity that he was trying to knock against. He was just knocking against it, but she wouldn't give an inch and that, to me, was the story. But I felt I had a moment. You know, I thought, Rand, you know, you, were, you said before, I think quite correctly, that now Brian Williams wants to be John Stewart or David Letterman, and David, and maybe David or John Stewart wants to be Brian Williams. That everybody wants these different jobs and to move out of their categories. Every once in a while, you see a. Mo- I, I saw that moment, and I thought, you know, John Stewart's really smart. But he hasn't really trained for this kind of right, thing. Exactly. And, and, but, really? you know, the fact I, that you are looking for Jon Stewart to be that champion, I think, signals also our sense of limitation with, with news anchors. I mean, all of us, if you follow different people, you have these fantasies. Like, one of my fantasies is put George F. Will and Noam Chomsky on a stage together and let them go at each other. They've never actually appeared together. I, I watched Chomsky's demolition of William F. Buckley on YouTube from 1963 recently. It's fascinating. So we want. Our guy. I mean, Brian Williams is never going to demolish anyone. What, what could he say to a really resourceful person like Judith Miller that might take her apart? What could Nothing. anyone say? What could any? I mean, well, no, do you, no, Colin, no. do you feel like he, just, he could have asked could. different questions? I, I don't know. Colin I don't know whether could. I could or not. But, right. but Kate, you wrap know, it up for us. We have to go to may, maybe. Uh, if you have to go to the BBC interviewers because they really yeah, they do. go after people and I, I don't think they're worried about losing their jobs. But does anybody really care if Brian Williams never comes back? My daughter. Yeah. She's Larkin. in love with him. <laughs> All right. We have to take a quick break. We're going to come back with endorsements after this. Wait, wait, wait. How can the era of the anchorman end if nobody's told us what's the frequency, Kenneth? 
Today's show was produced by Colin McEnroe and me, Kyone Wolf. Our intern is Kelsey Bissell, and Greg Hill appeared in the intro and tweets for us at WNPR Colin. Katie Talarski is our executive producer. The part of Bill Curry was played by Cleavon Little. For show pages, articles, and videos of the Faith Middleton Show staff shooting a donut into space, visit our website, wnpr.org slash Colin. On Monday's show, a salute to soda. And now, back to Colin. Not just a salute, though. Also, the question, will our love affair with soda survive the new FDA guidelines? Uh, we'll, we'll sort of look at both our fondness and our aversions there. OK, it's time for endorsements, an idea which we ruthlessly stole from our friends friends at the Slater Culture, Slate Culture Gab Fest, whatever it's called. Uh, so, Irene Papoulis, what's your endorsement? All right. Well, I want to start with a website called understandingcharliehebdo.com because they look at the – they parse the cartoons in, in, and they really – Explore. They're, they're bilingual. It's like very French in that they don't they don't tell us um, uh, who they are. It's just we're just a group of sociologists and, and and academics who are bilingual, and they talk about exactly what's going on in a number of cartoons. It's really interesting. Und- understanding he- CharlieHebdo dot com. Also, my friend Lucy Ferris wrote a really interesting book called A Sister to Honor, and um, I recommend it. All right, Kate, you've got an endorsement for us. Yes, I do. Downtown Hartford art scene. Kim Cannon's pop. Up art show featuring my buddy, the photographer Maurice D. Robertson and okay. others is happening tomorrow, Saturday, at the Hartford Seminary. And I also want to bring people's attention to uh, the fact that the Amistad Center for Arts and Culture has been newly renovated and reopened with a show called This Is My Story, This Is My Song, Writers, Musicians, and the Black Freedom Struggle. And uh, I got a uh, impromptu tour from uh, docent Gwen Lewis. It's a beautiful new reading room. With this is books. The, this is at the Athenaeum. We yes, should. at the Athenaeum. So when people go to see the uh, Coney Island show, they can go on upstairs and s- to the Amistad Center for Arts and Culture. Rand, what have you got for us? Two quick culinary endorsements in the. Uh, lovely little hamlet of South Glastonbury. There is a new Mexican restaurant called Sayulita, S-A-Y-U-L-I-T-A. It's upscale Mexican food. It's a beautiful restaurant. It's run by the guys who who, uh, run 25 Hopewell around the corner. South Glastonbury is this little place, like every place now has its sort of mojo. So you can get coffee that's roasted there. It's called Soji. So like South Glastonbury is now Soji. Sayulita restaurant. It's really great. Uh, the other thing is the former chef extraordinaire at Firebox, Sean Farrell, um, has left Firebox a number of uh, months ago, and he is now starting up a food truck. And he has a Kickstarter campaign. So go to Kickstarter CT Provisions, and it's Sean and his and his partners uh, farm to to truck food truck. CT Provisions Kickstarter. He's a great chef. He's doing a cool thing. All right. So I'm going to endorse the movie um, Ex Machina, uh, which is written and directed by Alex Garland. In fact, go back and read, but do not see the movie of Alex Garland's terrific novel, The Beach. Do not see the Leo DiCaprio movie. But um, Ex Machina, is it's the best movie that I've seen about this whole question of artificial intelligence and consciousness, the so-called hard problem. Uh, it's a, it has a tremendous performance by Oscar Isaacs uh, and by a bunch of other people whose name you would not, names you would not recognize. But uh, it's, I don't want to say too much about it, but it, it really is. It's a very, very smart movie. I liked it a lot more than I was expecting to. I guess I've got time here to do a couple of quick things. So um, on Wednesday night of next week, I'm going to be down at Bridgeport at the Klein with Danny Glover, who's going to be leading us in an evening on mass and incarceration on, and racial disparity. This is all uh, an evening sponsored by an organiza- organization called Family Reentry. You can find out about the event uh, at familyreentry.org or if you want to get really specific, they have a special separate website called familyreentryevents.org. Uh, and I'm going to be moderating a panel with a whole bunch of experts on on reentry from prison and on racial disparities and incarceration and Charles Grodin, who actually is very – had been interested and involved in all this stuff. So anyway, uh, but Danny Glover's uh, the big name. And then uh, I don't think there are many seats left for this, but also on Monday night down at, in New Haven at the Institute Library. I love the Institute Library so much. And so there's their annual fundraiser, which I'm going to say is called Book Plates. And what they do is they fan out to different restaurants and they have different hosts in each place. Uh, I'm going to be hosting in a restaurant called Thali, which uh, Rand knows quite well. Um, I think mine is sold out, but there are other ones that are available. So check on the Institute Library website for more about that. Thanks to Kate Russian making her great debut here. Irene Papoulis and Rand Richards Cooper will be back, be back on Monday. Farmington, yeah, 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 yeah.
I'm Kyone Wolf. Thanks for tuning in. That's the news. Ugh, I'm so ready to replace Brian Williams already. This market, it's nothing but entitled trust fund crybabies and old, cranky, out-of-touch has-beens who wouldn't know their ass from their... Uh, Kyone, we're still on the air. Breaking news. I'm now the news.